Hi, I'm Tony Robinson and I've been coming to this ground for over 25 years now, although of course its history goes back much further than that to the year 1897 when Bristol City Football Club was formed. Although you could date its formation to 10 years further back than that, to 1887, with the formation of a little club called Southville, which then changed its name to Bedminster when it merged with Bedminster Football and Cricket Club. By 1894, Bedminster had played their first match in the FA Cup and were attracting crowds of up to 4,000, but local competition soon arrived in the form of another club, Bristol South End. Although Bristol South End were turned down by the Bristol and District League, they arranged an attractive list of fixtures, which included Preston North End, Tottenham Hotspur and Swindon Town. And for six years, there was great rivalry between the two Bristol clubs. Two significant changes took place during this period. In 1897, Bristol South End changed its name to Bristol City and also decided to turn professional. Bedminster was soon to join them in the professional ranks and by 1898, both clubs were playing in the Southern League. It was during this period that Sam Hollis arrived from Woolwich Arsenal and he was to have a major influence on Bristol City's early years. After two years as their manager, he moved to Bedminster, but the two teams merged in 1900 and Hollis soon took over as manager of the amalgamated club. In 1901, Bristol City finally found themselves members of the Football League when they finished joint top in a very strong poll of applicants. The club's first game in the second division was on the 7th of September 1901, when Paddy O'Brien's two goals brought a 2-0 win at Blackpool. Led by Peter Chambers, a skilful left half who made 199 appearances for the club, Bristol City finished in the top six in each of their first four seasons, and in Billy Jones, they had their first England international. After a short spell playing at nearby St John's Lane, the Bedminster ground of Ashton Gate became the club's permanent home in 1904. And in 1905, with Harry Thicket having taken over from Sam Hollis as manager, the club had its best season to date. They notched up 30 league wins, and their record of winning 79% of their games has been bettered by only one club in the 20th century. Without doubt, the key player during this season and the successful seasons that followed was local boy Billy Wedlock, arguably City's greatest ever player. Although he was only five foot five inches tall, Wedlock was a centre half. He was capped 26 times for England and became known as the India Rubber Man for his ability to bounce up in defence or attack. He played for City until 1921 and retired to become licensee of the Star Inn opposite the main entrance to Ashton Gate, where he remained till his death in 1965. Paddy Wedlock must have, I mean, it must have been wonderful to have seen him. The lack of height he had, I remember him across the pub um, when he was landlord there. And I mean, he, it looked as though he was smaller than the bar, but I mean, back in those days, he, he must have been very small. In the late 1900s, City spent five years in the first division, and they got as close to winning the league championship and the FA Cup as they ever have done. In the season 1906-07, they missed out on the league by just three points, and two years later, they got to the FA Cup final. Another key figure in this run of success was inside forward Andrew Burton, who scored 51 goals in 216 appearances. And with Sammy Gilligan, another force in front of goal, City were difficult to contain. They survived nine games, including four replays, on their way to meeting Manchester United in the 1909 Cup Final at Crystal Palace. 
Unfortunately, midfielder Fred Staniforth's medal is a loser's one. City lost 1-0. This cup final appearance proved to be the pinnacle of City's achievements as a young club. Two years later, fortunes had changed and they were relegated. The club suffered financial difficulties and the great team of the 1900s broke up. It would take another 65 years before they were to return to the top division. Despite a good cup run in 1919, City supporters were forced to endure a topsy-turvy period in the years that followed. Within seven years, the club were twice relegated and twice champions of the recently established Division 3 South. Halfway through the first relegation season, Alex Racebeck, a famous Scottish international, began a spell as manager that was to last nearly eight years. But by the 1930s, the team were consigned to the third division. And it wasn't until after the Second World War that there began to be realistic talk about a return to the second. Don Clark had been the top goal scorer in Division 3 South in 1946-7. But when John Attio brought his goal scoring talents to Ashton Gate in 1951, promotion beckoned again. Harry Dolman became chairman and Pat Beasley took over as manager in 1950. In the fifth season of Beasley's five-year contract, he managed what City managers had been unable to do for 20 years, win promotion back to the second division. It was a side full of characters. It was the summer of 1953 and uh, I joined the ground staff. Uh, and the characters, I suppose, there, you had um, Ernie Peacock, you had uh, Dennis Roberts, uh, and Jimmy Rogers was one there. Well, we had Ernie Peacock, was a great character, wasn't yeah. Ernie? Ivor Guy. Uh, Bert Tyndall was a great player. We had Bert, Peter brought Bert Tyndall. And he didn't play for as long, did Bert, but he was a very good player. Good player was Bert, good pro. He could sort things out on the pitch, you know what I mean? No one could have had a better, I don't think a better club, or a better group of players to, uh, to play with. I mean, we, we had um, what I call a side then, you know? Everyone was playing for each other. And I think uh, we played in that side. Uh, they were the last people in 1955-56, I believe, uh, to win a championship. In that championship winning side was John Attio, a club legend. He was tall, he was strong, he was difficult to dispossess, and he was the leading scorer in 11 of his 15 seasons here. He turned his back on crappy little clubs like Liverpool and Chelsea and spent his entire career at Ashton Gate. He even played for England six times between 1955 and 1957. And he scored five times in those six matches, which is, when you think of it, a better strike rate than Alan Shearer. Well, John, uh, he's out on his own, really. He was a good, great player, you know. Very unfortunate not to have played for England a lot more times. I often think uh, whether, he, whether he wanted to, he, he'd, he'd done it, you know, I think. And uh, he was that type of fella, John, but, oh, Powerful. He was powerful and a great finisher. I mean, he was very calm under pressure. I mean, he could have as much pressure on him as he liked and he still picked his spot. But he could go in those early, in the early, I call it early days there for me in the, in the, in the mid sort of 50s, mid to, to late 50s. Um, he would power himself past people. He would go and I knew, and the, or we, we knew which way he was going to go and he always went the same way. You know, he would take the ball to the left and take it then with the outside and you couldn't do anything about it because he was so powerful and strong and that's what got him through you know but I mean he was skillful as well I mean it wasn't taking that away from him but I always remember him for a powerhouse in a way you know and he was as good in the air as he was on the floor as well. England in white shirts get the first real scoring chance when Ron Flowers takes a free kick. Attio heads and in it goes but it's no goal. The ref disallows it for pushing by an Englishman. Right winger Tom Finney passes to inside right John Atio, who passes back again. But Finney's fouled by Spanish left back Campanal, and it's a penalty. Finney takes it, but Goli Carmelo saves. Looks as though he's going to have to work hard. Spain's defence is very patchy. Now England's forwards move in. The ball goes to Finney, and back to Nat Lofthouse. Now run Clayton to John Atio, who shoots, and he's made it. A goal with almost his first kick in an English shirt. Brazil score early in the second half, but England soon strike back. Johnny Haynes passes through a defender's legs to John Atio. Atio shoots, but Gilmar saves. 
great character, great memory. Uh, I remember him as a, I used to spend a lot of time with him on the coach on away trips and uh, tremendous memory. You can remember, remember games um, very, very finely. Um, and they, they, they named him actually, his nickname was Rosie, Rosie the Elephant. And that's what he, uh, they used to call him down the ground, the lads. Uh, but a uh, great player. Never six foot two, 13 stone. Uh, very rarely smashed the ball in. Um, very delicate touch. Uh, great player. One of the great traditions here at Bristol City is a tiny amount of rivalry with the gaseous Bristol Rovers. And in 1958, 40,000 spectators saw an epic FA Cup duel in the fifth round. <laughs> It was Bristol Rovers in quartered shirts kicking off against Bristol City in the biggest local derby of round five. First on 40,000 saw a game which, for sheer excitement, beat anything they remember. City outside right Hinshelwood started the move that brought the first goal of this astounding match. He made ground before sending the ball to Atio, but it was Watkins who scored. The game was well settled down before Rovers equalised. The outside left Hooper beat Terrace, passed to Sykes and the right half score. City tried hard to regain the lead, but Thresher's free kick had no difficulties for Nichols. He put the ball back into the City half. Rovers outside right Petherbridge put over a centre which Anderson only partly cleared. Inside left Ward shot low into the net near the post. Rovers two, City one. There was no stopping Rovers now. Outside left Hooper's shot was parried by Anderson, but Meyer scored. Second half, Bristol City losing 1-3 at this stage, where a team transformed after the interval. For some time, they dominated the rover. City's revival was begun by the inside left Etheridge. His terrific shot had Nichols helpless. City two, rovers three. 40,000 people were on their toes. What the game it was. For a time, it seemed that nothing could stop Bristol City. How well they deserved the equaliser when it came their way. Left half Burden sent a cracking shot past Nichols. It was three all. Another spectacular save by Nichols. There were still seven minutes to go. Bristol fans had never seen anything to compare with this. Rovers attacked, City defence let Ward through. He passed to Bradford, the centre forward scored the winning goal. By four to three in an unforgettable game, Bristol Rovers won through into the sixth round. What the cameras failed to catch was a penalty miss by John Watkins, which has haunted him ever since. I've always said the goalkeeper saved it and I didn't miss it, because I think if you put it over the bar or other side of the post, you'd miss it. If the goalkeeper goes down, he saves it. Anyway, um, I said I scored the first five minutes. They had this penalty. I had scored 14 on the trot, and just as I was about to take it, Joshua Watlin went up to Ron Nichols, and I knew what he was going to say, you put it down to your right-hand side. I thought, well, why change the habit of a lifetime? I hit it, but I didn't hit it well as I normally would, and I told you the idea of put it in the other corner, but I didn't. Um, he saved it, and we went on and lost 4-3. In the 50s and 60s, the influence of Harry Dolman as chairman can't be overestimated, but occasionally he did take his role one step too far. Our chairman, we, chairman Harry Dolman then, we were um, having a bit of a torrid time and uh, he tried to help us. And it was genuine help, sincere help, and um, he did ask permission from the manager to give a little pep talk, as it were, and explain a few of the tactics to us, like, you know? And he was saying, well, when we kick off, Jim will pass to John, John will pass to Cyril, Cyril will pass to Tom. In the meantime, Jim and John have gone forward, and hit a long ball through, and, you know, we got a chance of scoring the goal. And then big Dennis Roberts, and he was six foot two, he hadn't got a, about as fat as a rusher of bacon, went down the front to the blackboard where 
Mr. Dolan was uh, doing all these diagrams and kicked the blackboard up in there. And this was the type of man Harry Dolman was. And he said, why did you do that, Dennis? And he said, that's the opposition. But there can be no doubting Dolman's commitment to the club. The thing that uh, I can remember more about him than, than anything else was uh, when we did win promotion and we had a champagne celebration up in the boardroom when um, he wept into his champagne. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, I'm the happiest man, he said, ever. Between 1950 and 1967, the club had three full-time managers, Pat Beasley, Peter Doherty and Fred Ford. And amazingly, each time when they departed, the same man stepped into the breach as caretaker manager, club physio Les Bardsley. Well, every time they sacked the manager, he used to come to me and ask me, to, he said, you're in charge, Les. And I used to say to myself, what am I doing here, being a manager again? Yeah, Pat was a good bloke, really, and I was amazed that he got, he got uh, sacked. Because Pat brought me here, you see, because I, I knew Pat. When I was captain of Berry and he was captain of Fulham, he used to toss up. And he always used to say to me, because he knew that I was a qualified physiotherapist then, he said, when I get a manager's job, I want you to come be my trainer, Les. And I never thought nothing about it. But when he came here, he, uh, he sent for me and I came down here. I left Berry and came down here. Pat, little short but uh, smart little fella, and his game was smart. I, I remember seeing him a couple of games in, in the... Uh, late 40s and 50, uh, early 50s as a schoolboy. My dad used to bring me on a regu regular basis. We used to s stand up at the back of the shed. But Pat was, you know, a uh, uh, very s smart footballer, a smart dresser. But his game was like that. It was sharp and, and clean, you know. Uh, quite a wonderful character. Uh, and then we go on to, we leave Jimmy Seed out because we only had him for about a fortnight. And uh, Peter, again, uh, Quite a good manager, but trouble is, bent very tight in his own ways, didn't give at all. You know, it had to be his way, in his way only. And I think this is where he fell down. But uh, it, looked, it looked as though he must have been a very, very skillful player, but skillful in his way. And... We had lots of problems when Peter came, as you know, with different things, and we, we actually went down. I was the manager when we went down. Mm. Uh, that was just not very good in my career. That was kind of the first time I've ever been relegated. <laughs> and uh, coming home, was not we played away, we played South End, I think, or something. We played somebody away, I forget who it was now. And not a very good trip home that wasn't. No. My burning ambition had always been being a local lad to play with Bristol City. So I, I opted to sign for the city uh, when Peter Doherty took control. Um, that was in 58. 59 I made my debut when I was 16. Um, which was a difficult period for the club really because Doherty had brought about half the team he brought down from Doncaster where he came from and it was a very difficult period. Uh, Doherty never lasted too long even though he was obviously a great player in his time and then Fred Ford came to the club. Um, that was about 19, probably about 1960. Uh, Fred was um, an unusual character. I can remember his first uh, training session. Uh, we went over the park just across the road and I say I was only about 17 then and um, Fred had been in the war He'd been a bomb disposal expert, and he used a bit of army tactics. Took us behind the swimming baths, which were in the park then, and threatened one or two of the players, because there had been some political problems with the club, with Doherty, in the Doherty era. And uh, Fred uh, started off on the right foot, really. Sorted a few out and uh, went on from there. And great guy, really. Uh, went a bit, uh, a bit potty occasionally, but uh, a genuine man, you know, and uh, all the lads loved him, you know. Uh, Fred and I, we, we fell out in, in a period of time, that's how I come to lead the club, but become very firm friends after, but Fred was an honest, sort of straight bloke, you know, honest man. What a character was Fred. Oh, I'll laugh a minute with Fred, really. I, we, I, we, I like Fred. Fred was uh, very down to earth with Fred, of course, and uh, he was all right. I like Fred. 1966 saw the retirement of John Attio after 15 years, 596 league games and 314 goals, a club record. His achievements were honoured by Harry Dolman at a farewell dinner that year. 15 years ago, just about 15 years ago, I signed him. And it was a great day for me when I signed him. And it's been some wonderful times watching him play. He has given thousands and thousands of people 
great enjoyment with his football. Yeah. And some of the goals that he scored have been wonderful. John has given us all some, um, some very happy memories. And I think John, John Attia will go down in history as just one of those wonderful footballers in Bristol, like Jess, Jeff Bradford and Fatty Wedlock to mention too. And um, I hope that we should get some more like him. Yeah. Yeah. Then in 1967, following the departure of Fred Ford, a new manager arrived from Coventry. His name, Alan Dix. I know the Bristol City Club. I've, uh, uh, in the second division last year, we played against them. I know some of the players, uh, and I feel that they are potentially, or they have potentially, the ground and a city to support first division football. And my aim is always, or if you are ambitious, you want to get to the top. And I feel this is one of the cities that support a first division club. Although Dix had a tough time at first, a cup run in 1974 saw City take on Leeds in the fifth round. And remember, this was the time when Leeds were at their most awesome. It was a super game. I mean, the atmosphere was tremendous. The, the ground was full. Um, Leeds were full of great stars. And on the day, we matched them in every department. Uh, I remember Billy Bremner's because it didn't seem to be a very dangerous situation and uh, suddenly let fly and it was in the back of the net. A goal for Leeds by Billy Bremner, who has won so many cup ties for them in the past and puts them ahead at a crucial moment in this one. Second half, uh, we kept going and kept plugging away. I think it was B. Jerry Gow slipped a great ball through to Keith Fee and he came through the middle of the, the Leeds defence and as uh, Harvey came out, Keith just lobbed it over the top of his head into the net and we equalised and it was great. Great joy and jubilation. Um, Keith was a tremendous player. He had uh, fabulous skills, tremendous close control. Um, his only weakness, Keith had ever, and he was a small guy, but very good near. Um, good two feet, and he could kick, strike the ball great with either feet. Um, possibly his work rate was, if anything, let Keith down. Um, but he more than made up for that with his skill. City surprised everyone in the replay when a goal from Donny Gillis knocked out the First Division Giants. And although they went on to lose 1-0 in the sixth round to the eventual cup winners Liverpool, a side of real potential was coming together. I think it was probably the strength of the side was our defensive setup, and that meant everybody was involved, the forwards, the midfield players. Cash was a great keeper. Dave Rogers, Gary Collier, um, Brian Drysdale, Donny Gillies, Jerry Sweeney, they all sort of alternated a bit. I think it, all around the pitch they had, they had their own characters but they, they were all strong in will, in will. They were, they were very, not very as technical as some sides but a workman like team but, and, and we, all, we all worked together and Clive was one of the players that was really up and coming, young, exciting player, took, took full backs on for a past time and just knocked loads of balls into the box and the service there was absolutely superb. Yeah, Jerry Gow, Trevor Tainton, Jimmy Mann and then Jerry Sweeney came into midfield um, when we had a couple of injury problems and Gilly went to right back and it fitted very nicely. We were a bit fortunate really during that season, we didn't have as many injuries as um, some sides usually have. I think that, that really is the key to the, to the success. But as promotion beckoned, it was the strike force of Tom Ritchie and Paul Cheesley that was making the headlines. When you look at Paul's strength, I mean, if you've seen him in the air, I mean, he was just unbelievable in the air. Um, powerful, the quickest thing over sort of 10 yards at the club. Uh, quickest thing I've ever seen over 10 yards, really, for a big lad. You know, he was so quick. And as I say, it was the way we played, you know, sort of, he was an outlet for us. If, if, if we were struggling to sort of pass the ball to feet, you could always rely on sort of knocking one up and sort of say, go on in battle, Paul. And he would win 99% of the battle. You know, and, and, and I was lucky enough to be playing alongside him at the time to sort of feed off him, you know. Uh, Tom Ritchie read my game very, very well, and we worked well off each other. Um, I was a big, ugly one that went for all the, the roughy, toughy stuff, and Tom picked up the pieces. But in his own right, he was out of a player without me being in the side. As the side came together, one of Tom Ritchie's best performances was a hat-trick against struggling York City. I, I only ever got two hat tricks, you know. Sort of one that was one of them. One when I, I moved to Sunderland, like you know. But the one down here against York sticks in the mind. Um, first one was a, a fluky header, I think. 
you know, sort of 50 50 head and bounced off me, probably. Richie. Well, it had to come. Again, Crawford, aware of the danger of Chisley's head, coming for the ball. Jimmy Mann picking it up on the far post and keeping his cool very well to find Richie on what for him was the far post. Um, second one, round the, I, was, I, I quite enjoyed the second one, went round the goalkeeper. And Swallow in trouble, Richie in on Crawford, number two. And the third one uh, was, for me, a fair old whack, I suppose. <laughs> it's probably about 20 yards, which is about the furthest I've ever hit a ball. Prince three points out of four from Bristol City last season. And it's went some way to costing Bristol promotion. And here's Richie now. And making the most of something of a gift. But as well a hit hat trick, as you'll see. That's the way to take number three. And now, the hard work of Alan Dix was being rewarded. Um, I think looking back, he did a, um, an absolute marvellous job for the club. He didn't have a great deal of money to spend at the time. And having did what he did with us, um, all of us, um, as you say, played together for a long, long time and came up through the ranks together. Um, I think one of his great strengths was motivation. Um, I think him along with the coaching staff, Ken Wimshurst and um, all the others down to the youth team, you know, they all blended in well together. I suppose Alan was very much a leader. He, he had a group of young boys that he sort of um, showed them how to live their life and showed them how to play. Uh, it started off the field and then went through. He told us he was a very organised person. He liked to have an organised team. Um, and, and basically just nurtured us and sort of brought us on from being 15, 16 years old to young men. Well, he was always pretty straight with you. You, you knew exactly what was going on. He looked after his players. Um, if we didn't do well, we got a rollicking. If we did well, then it was well done. That's what you paid for. Go out and do it again the next match. Um, every player at that time had ups and downs with him. But you're bound to. And people thought they were, shouldn't have been dropped when they were, and vice versa, they should be playing. Um, but. I, I think the fact that a lot of us had come through together with the same management team meant a great deal more than is probably evident in some clubs these days. And so, with Dix at the helm, we watched as on that fateful day, the 20th of April 1976, Bristol City played Portsmouth here and they had to win if they were going to get promotion to the first division for the first time for 65 years. Um, Portsmouth were already relegated actually and George Graham played the youngsters and to be quite fair they were very very hard side to break down I mean they were playing for places the next season we had the jitters about going up we needed two points from two games and I flipped a ball on and Clyde just lashed his hand folly into the roof of the net and well that was it then I mean the place just erupted and that's with it as well it's really nice feelings. It was a great relief to us all when the whistle went I mean it was a culmination of probably two to three years hard work and uh, it came on that one night and it was, it was a tremendous achievement for us really. It was a marvellous feeling. I think when it happens, it, the significance of it does actually sink in. I mean, 20 years, 20 years on now, it's, it's, I get more pleasure probably out of scoring that goal than what I probably did at the time. Um, and the effects it had on the club, some good, some bad. I mean, I, I remember it as if it was yesterday. How can you describe it? It was probably the best, best day of my life. Um, once again, the ground was, was full of people. Everyone was wishing us well, which was great. Um, and everything went according to plan. I mean, I've never been involved in a situation where it was just the atmosphere, you could cut it with a knife. It was marvellous. And after the game, to see all the older chaps, you know, the, the lads in their 60s, that, some in their 70s, that have been waiting for this moment for their entire life. And suddenly, promotion was gained. And, I remember seeing a couple of them actually in tears in the stand. You know, they just couldn't believe that Bristol City had, had sort of um, attained the first division. Yeah. One for Bristol City, two for the boys in red, three for the fans down Ashton King. Follow till we're dead, me boys. Follow till we're dead. And the red, red robin
humans too If they win or if they lose We'll follow them through and through I spend a little time on a Saturday I'm ready for anything Spend an hour or two in a bloody girt queue To get in the ground and sing One blood of Frisco City Two for the boys in red Three for the fans of Ashton Gate We'll follow till we're men The very first game in the First Division was against Arsenal at Highbury, and it was an occasion to savour, particularly for club captain Jeff Merrick. To actually get promotion with Bristol City, and then to go to the first division and lead them out at Highbury, well, um, that was the height of my dreams. I just couldn't imagine that there was anything else in life that was worth having. It was, uh, like I say, the, the best match of, I think, probably our stay in the, in the first division. Um, we had some great players to play against. I mean, Super Mac, who probably people these days don't really know about, but he was he was the Alan Shearer of the time. You know, he was a tremendous player. Well, I thought my first thought was that I was going to be the best striker on the pitch because Malcolm McDonald, as you obviously know, uh, had been transferred in the close season, and in every piece of media he was going to uh, turn over the country bumpkins and all this. And um, I think we just decided that it wasn't going to happen on the day and. And everybody rose to the occasion, and I don't think anybody was nervous about it at all. We knew the job at hand, we knew we were against a totally international side, and we just said, well, we're here now, we might as well do something. And um, fortunately for us on the day, I think we outplayed them and, and we got the result. I honestly felt that when we went into that game, we had nothing to lose. And uh, it seemed as though, because Malcolm McDonald was there, all the pressure was on Arsenal. And I can honestly say on the, on the day of that game, I don't think there was any, any doubt, really, and who should have won the game. In fact, one of the things when walking away from it, you probably should have won three or four nil. Because I think Tom and Cheese had chances, had good chances. I think they'd probably think that, you know, they should have scored more than what they did. Because on the day, I thought we played exceptionally well. And I, I can think, looking back on the highlights, is that Arsenal probably had a shot from the lad Ross from about 25 yards. That's the only sort of... Uh, chance I can remember. And McDonald you never saw, Borley you never saw, and it was, it was all us. To wriggle free to find a yard or so of space. Here's Cheesley, who's looked very dangerous. What a good ball there for Richie, and he's hit well. And Rimmer couldn't be sure whether that was going just inside or just out, and he couldn't take a chance. Scoop forward this time. Now, Richie all right. He's onside. Now, can he make something of this? He can't because O'Leary did a magnificent job in defence. Jimmy Mann knocked a ball out to Tom and Tom went wide. David O'Leary made a tackle. Clive got the, got the ball, had a couple of touches and I got across a couple of defenders and just the instinctive thing, he just had it towards goal and it, everything was right, he just hit the back of the net. Wonderful. Then he jumped over the stand. Well, he's put over so many lovely little crosses, Whitehead, and there was another of them. The marking very questionable there. The heading superb of Paul Cheesley and Bristol City score their first goal back in the first division. And the Bristol City fans beginning to shout and cheer a little louder and it's all over and Bristol City have come back to the first division with a victory. The last time the sides met was 1919-1920 in the FA Cup and Bristol City won then by a goal to nil. Now they've done it again with this goal by Paul Cheesley in the second half. The side walked out to a great reception for their first home game back in the top division against Stoke, but they couldn't have known that their star striker was only minutes away from a career-ending injury. Gilly's goal in a one-all draw meant little when Paul Cheesley collided with Peter Shilton. I'll say again, Peter Shilton didn't do anything wrong. It'd be lovely to have an excuse, but um, I just landed very, very awkwardly. And so no doubt about it, he was going to be an exceptional player, Cheese. Um, I, I mean, I like playing with him because you could sling balls into him. Uh, he was good in the air, he was quick, two good feet. It, it's disappointing when looking back at it, is that when it actually happened, we didn't realise the consequences of losing him. Because I don't think we realised what we could have achieved. Um, I think we had quite a few years left ahead of us. And I think that is one of the biggest moments in the history of Bristol City Football Club when I was here, is the loss of Paul Cheesley. Because, I, I mean, we're talking about great players now, but he could have been a great player. There's no doubt in my mind about that. You, you keep coming back to what I played with, and, and Big Paul was the one. Um, 
And I think he's already been said, I think Clive sort of said, I mean, just a devastating blow to this club that um, he finished as early as he did. You know, so it was just a tragedy, you know. If you looked at the lads that were about at that time, you had Paul Mariner at, at Plymouth at the time, who was an up and coming centre forward. And if you've seen the two of them, I mean, we played Plymouth and you had a comparison there. And you thought, great player, big Paul Mariner. Uh, but I just, obviously, I'm biased, like, you know, but I thought Paul would, would have had the edge. And Paul was just learning the game, as we all were at that time. You know, we were just sort of a bunch of young kids sort of learning the game, you know, sort of as quick as we could. Um, and, and you had a lot to offer, uh, a lot more still to give, Paul. Cheesley's loss was a terrible, terrible blow. And as the goals dried up, so form suffered. In their last match against Coventry, both teams needed to win to avoid relegation, unless Sunderland lost to Everton on the same night, in which case a draw would do. The game started late, and when City pulled back a two-goal deficit, the atmosphere was electric. Then the managing director of Coventry, who was some bloke called Jimmy Hill, flashed up the final result from Goodison on the electronic scoreboard. Sunderland nil, Everton two. The crowd went potty and of course immediately the players on both sides knew what had happened. Uh, Jimmy Hill was a very clever man. I think it was probably pre-planned that uh, we kicked off 15 minutes late. Um, when it, I, I didn't actually play in the game. I'd, I'd, I'd had, my wife had had a couple of twins and things weren't sort of going too well and Alan decided to leave me out. So I actually sat in the stand and smoked about 25 fags I think those days. You know. But I, I did see the score go up and I just, I could see everybody looking at one another and saying, you know, because obviously they were trying to get the message on that both teams were safe. And I could see them all sort of looking nervously at one another and wondering whether they should actually attempt to score goals or whether they should just stay in their own half. And I think Gilly tells the story that one of their lads sort of strayed across the halfway line and he said, uh, you know, where are you going? You stay in your own bit, you yeah. um, I don't think there was ever anything uh, sort of laid down between the um, our, our side in Coventry. Um, it was just how it all ended up actually. Once you saw that uh, score uh, flash up on the scoreboard there, um, it was just a natural thing to do for both sides and we were both happy to keep it that way. Getting back in that dressing room, we were all so relieved that we'd actually did it and um, helped the club to stay where they were. At that time, um, Alan Dix was over the moon and we all were. And needless to say, the, uh, uh, the old beers was flowing that night. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, cheers. Well done, well done Bristol City, well done lads. But the shortage of goals was a worry. A partner was needed for Tom Ritchie. Alan Dix turned to former City player Chris Garland. Um, he's just a lovely lad, daft lad Chris, you know, sort of great in the dressing room um, and a smashing lad to play with. You know, sort of, um, Chris, he was one for playing football, you know, so then if he can get it back. Then, in 1977, Joe Royal arrived from Man City. It was an inspired signing. Yes! Deflection! But Royal will claim it! Big Joe was a tremendous lad. Tremendous character off the field as well as on the field. He was a, he was a great help to the boys on the field. Uh, he'd worked with little Kevin Marbot, guiding him, talking to him all the time. <clears throat> and that helped, obviously, help young Kevin, a uh, young player coming on. And off the pitch as well. Uh, Big Joe showed great character in the dressing rooms, plenty of chat, plenty of jokes, uh, good at handling situations, talked football all the time, you know, and he was a good influence in the dressing room as, as well as a good influence on the football field. Exceptional character, on and off the pitch, great help. You, can, you could see as soon as he walked in the sort of player that he, you know, that he had been and, and what he was bringing to this football club. Immensely strong, very good in the air. I mean, when you say about people being good in the air, I mean, some people can win balls in the air, and some people knew where the ball was going when they headed it. I mean, he was exceptionally clever the way he used the ball with his head. And he was, he was a big front man. I mean, he, he had a lot of knowledge, and he messed a lot of people about, and he was a great asset to the club. Further experience had arrived the season before in the shape of former England international Norman Hunter. Obviously, Norman was a great influence on my game because we, when I did get into the side and with, with Norman alongside me, it, it meant Jeff moving across the left back, um, which probably wasn't Jeff's best position, but at the time it was certainly beneficial to the club. Um, Nor Norman was obviously a great influence. He would 
give you a little words of advice. He knew my style of play, I knew his. And between the two of us, we got on very well. I mean, basically, he'd say, you go and win it, and I'll drop off and have all the glamour stuff, you know, putting foot on the ball and waving to the crowd, so. He'd, he'd pick on people he, he knew he could ruffle up. And uh, one of the, the major things we used to do is actually, between him and Jerry Gow, um, he used to look before the start to see who the referee was in the afternoon to know how far you could get away with it or whether you were going to be booked just because of who the referee was. The 1978-79 season was City's best in the top flight and they finished 13th, notching up some impressive scalps, including that of champions Liverpool. Gal floats it in. Rogers. What a super volley! It's the highway to chase. Beautiful pass. Away he goes. Great stop there by David Rogers, stooping amongst the flying boots. And away comes City. Richie pulling Thompson out. He made the angle and let fly, but Clements of England was right there. Tainton. Sweeney. Rogers. Hunter. Donny Gillis. And again. Well, this is patient build-up by Bristol. Now it's for Royal to battle for. Hansen gets above him, but Gao has it, and that's a good shot. That was just a tremendous shot by Jerry Gao. Alan Kennedy for Dalglish. That's where he's dangerous, and if this is dangerous, and that's a fine save by John Shaw. McDermott, they got Highway wide on the right. Using him as a decoy. It's Neil to Case. To Sunes, this is dangerous, this is McDermott. Ray Kennedy, Highway, Sunes, letting one go, oh and what a stinger, Tainton, Donny Gillis, Peter Cormack, Tainton, Thompson clearing, Royal will send Whitehead in, now this is dangerous. Well, he had Whitehead inside for a chip, but Clive elected to shoot, and Clements was there. The pace of the game, terrific at times. Patient midfield build-up, and then frenzied faster. Quite an entertaining mixture, but of course the big crowd, most of all, want a Bristol goal. And just these last few moments, Bristol have begun to push forward nicely. Whitehead. Richie. Gow. That's for Gillies. A good nod down. And he's there! A tremendous goal by Joe Royal! And the crowd love that. by Clive Whitehead. Beats Hansen. And Tom Ritchie can't quite connect. Good piece of work there by the substitute. 
crowd whistling for the final whistle, but Mr Salmon looking at his watch and keeping play going. Bristol's throw. They've worked for this victory, they've survived a few crises, but most of all they've worked, and worked, and they've got it! And the crowd are on their feet, and it's Bristol City 1, Liverpool nil. and there's the man who's 75th winning goal, turned the tide in the West Country's favour. But they couldn't sustain their form the next year, and the glory days were over. When they were relegated in 1980, they'd been in the First Division for just four years. But those years weren't without their great moments. Richie. Cormac. That's a good ball, Merrick coming in. And touched him by fear! Tainton. Man. Fine goal. We really have seen a couple of very cleanly hit goals. Richie. Sweeney. Richie. Fair bit of space. Gowling out to the left has pulled away. Richie going on his own through the gap and making it pay! Getting it back from Royal, good play by John Bain, here's Sweeney. Mabbott. Ritchie goes in, and it's there! Tom Ritchie! Rogers arrived. David Rogers took it well. Berry and Royal having quite a duel. Royal gets slightly the better of that. Oh, it's there! It's there. Jerry Gow. And that really was an error in the Wolves' defence. Troubled times were to follow. The next year brought further relegation to the third division and Alan Dix was dismissed after 13 years as manager. His only consolation, he did have a sweet little baby son called Julian. That season saw rivals Bristol Rovers at Ashton Gate for five games, following a fire at their home ground, Eastville. And ironically, they too went down to Division 3. Aww. The rot didn't stop there. Next season, City were relegated yet again to the 4th Division and they established a new record. They were the first ever team to be relegated from the 1st to the 4th Division in successive seasons. Well done, you Robins. Worse was to come. On the 21st of October 1981 came the announcement of a £700,000-plus debt. But with the future of the club seemingly doomed, a new company was hastily formed. Bristol City PLC. There were conditions, however, and it was the players who suffered. Eight of them, all on high wages and long contracts, were forced to accept redundancy. These eight, who became known as the Ashton Gate Eight, were Peter Aitkin, Chris Garland, Jimmy Mann, Julian Marshall, Jeff Merrick, David Rogers, Jerry Sweeney and Trevor Tainton. At the time it was a great upheaval, it was a very emotional decision to make, especially that for the eight of us we weren't guaranteed anything, it was all relying on the fact that this, the new share issue would be a success. So we we probably 18 months later perhaps felt that did we do the right thing? You know, should we have called the bluff and seen what would have happened with Bristol City? But, as I say, the majority of us were local people anyway. So your love of the club came all the way through from that 17 years of age to when this happened in 82. I've had some other things that have gone on in my life. I mean, family problems and that, 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 that have been pretty bad. But I would say of my life until that moment, it was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I think it took me 10 years to get over it, um, financially as well as mentally. 
th th there was a lot that was said, there was a lot of things done that never actually came out in public. Um, things that were said by directors and things that were said um, defamating our characters to a degree which was hard to take and we couldn't really say anything about it. And to this day I still feel that we were blackmailed into leaving jobs that we hadn't really done anything to um, spoil. We'd all been here for a long, long time. We're very much Bristol City orientated. And the last thing we wanted to do was leave. I mean, we would have dropped wages. We would have done anything. We would have done anything to stay and help the club. Because whilst we were sort of in our 30s, we still had some experience and we still had some ability. And I feel that had they gone for another method of keeping the club afloat, which was a possibility, um, we could have played for less money and the club maybe would, have, would not have gone so far down. When Terry Cooper became player manager on the 19th of May 1982, he took over a new company which relied mainly on untried youngsters as playing assets. Rob Newman was one of them. I was 18 years old at the time and like, if you'd have told me like 12 months be, uh, prior to that that you'd be in the first team like then, I'd say no, like you know, there's no chance. But it came sooner, and I think in a, in a way it was a good thing because like it came so quickly. I mean, even though we had an inkling, but I mean, we didn't really think that we'd be in the team. But it happened, and uh, I think you know, praise has got to be to the the players that tore up their contracts. What you mean? Because basically, you mean at the bottom line, they they saved the club. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, you don't want to let them go out of like the club's history because you know what they did was like a major thing for Bristol City Football Club, it was the dawn of a new era. Like, and I think they should be, they should be part of that, really. They, they should be part of the birth of the, of the new club. After two weeks at the very bottom of the fourth division, things started to get better, and in 1984, we were promoted. Then, in 85-6, a first ever Wembley final beckoned. But having lost 2-0 in the first leg of the Southern final of the Freight Rover Trophy to Hereford, of all people, it looked as though our chances had gone. It was on a par with the, with the final, really, that night, obviously 2-0 down, everybody had wrote us off, although we played well at Hereford, and the, I think it was only the players who were involved felt that we could do it. Everybody else had written us off, and we approached the game in the right manner, and we went out, and we went out to score three goals. Although it took us extra time, we scored the three goals in extra time, and it was a fabulous night for everybody. And I think 15 minutes into the second half, you know, we never really looked like scoring. And then Glynn scored one, um, maybe a little bit fortuitous, you know, fortuitous with uh, the goalkeeper making a mistake. Um, and then we got the own goal. Pritch Cross went into the back of the net. And then it went into extra time. And then um, I can remember one of their players struck a shot from 25 yards and it hit the crossbar and bounced straight down into Woffy's arms. So, you know, looking back, it looks like, you know, it was meant to be our night. Um, and then obviously in the last minute of extra time, I scored the winner. And for me, that probably was more, meant more to me than the actual final. You know, the scenes after it were just unbelievable. Um, very enjoyable. Something that, uh, you know, something I don't think any lads will forget. And so to Wembley, where their opponents were Bolton Wanderers it seemed that half of Bristol were travelling up the M4. It was a special day in my life. I never expected being there. And the support was absolutely unbelievable. Nobody expected 25, 30,000 turning up. And that shows what sort of support's there if they get the right team again to get into the Premiership. You read in the paper that there was going to be 8,000 there, then there was going to be 10,000, 15. And I think at the actual day, I think there was like between 25 and 30,000 people from Bristol, which was unbelievable. After the Hereford game, the, the build-up was tremendous. Uh, we had a few spin-offs. I remember trying to get uh, a holiday out of Bristol City uh, on behalf of the boys being skipper, uh, maybe Spain or wherever, but they wouldn't have none of that. And they actually, I think they decked us out and forced us suits at the end of the day. On the day, Bolton started the better. The first 20 minutes was unbelievable. I think Acer Hartford was playing in the, the centre midfield with Bolton. And he just kept passing the ball to the left winger, as it was Mark Gavin then. And as all Bristol City fans like, they, he's quite a talented player. Like when he when he uh, came down to play for Bristol, and he kept, he kept giving him the ball. Like and he basically just roasted me alive for the first 20 or 25 minutes. But then, like, as you say, I got booked after about 20 minutes, and uh, he seemed to peter out of the game really. So it was just a case of him marking me and me marking him for the rest of the game really. 
Mark, Mark had been doing quite well as Mark came to the club. Uh, I remember Rob Newman uh, giving him a good old whack. Coops gave him a shout and uh, Rob Newman got booked for it. Then a few minutes later, Tony hit the bar and Woffy says wide, he let it go, he, he was happy with that. Uh, and then two minutes before half time, I think Keith Kill knocked the ball in. Uch went up with the keeper. Uh, he, he like knocked it down and it just dropped half volley nice for me and I just smashed it in the back of the goal. And I just went on one of me mazes like I normally did. And then two minutes later, the, the whistle went. So that was a nice settling down period. Uh, and after that, we dominated the game. I was very young and uh, probably don't know as much as what we know the older we get and uh, looking after our bodies and cramp very early and uh, having to suffer the whole game with cramp and just thinking, I'm not coming off at Wembley. I'm not, there's no way, my family are all down from Scotland here. I'm not going to come off and, and let them down. And as it was, we went on and in the second half, we scored the goals, which uh, made it a bit more comfortable and uh, made me a bit more comfortable as well. I, think I can remember that, that the second half, you just went out there and you felt the tension had gone, the nerves had gone, and you just went out as if you was playing just on a park pitch. You know, you forgot about where you was and we played our football. I think on, on the day, I think, um, especially the third guard, I think you'd have to go a long way to see a better goal at Wembley than, than the third goal. Well, even Phil Neal said, he said that the, the goal was well, like first division standard. Uh, like Big Walsh, he whacked, one, uh, whacked a hell of a ball out to Howard, and Howard turned inside, pulled it back, smashed another ball out, another 30 yard ball out to Stevie Neville, and he came inside, and I just pulled away from the defender and he dinked it just over the head and I just came on and caught it nice. Neville against Sutton, chips it. Riley, go! Riley's second goal, 3-0, five minutes to go. And the Bristol City fans going mad. And there goes the result. Bristol City have won the 1986 Freight Rover Trophy by three goals to nil as the Bolton Wanderers fans pour out. Well, now we're going to see moments of celebration for Bristol City. Reminds us of the days back in 1976, promotion days for Bristol City. We haven't seen scenes like this before. 25,000 plus people from the West Country coming up to Wembley. And a moment for those players, probably never get back to Wembley again, many of them. A moment for them to savour, and let's just enjoy it with them. Now the moment he's been waiting for. It doesn't matter what cup you pick up at Wembley, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it might be the Freight Rover Cup, uh, it could be the FA Cup. Uh, I was very proud to be captain of Bristol City at that time. And that was you no know, fantastic. You no know, walking around Wembley, it was an occasion you didn't want to come off the park. Uh, you wanted to stay out there. We had a we had a great support up with us, and uh, I mean Bristol City itself. have got a fantastic uh, crowd and really great potential. Uh, and at that day, I think we showed it. The following year, after such a long wait, they were back at Wembley again in the final against Mansfield. One all after extra time, and the game went to penalties. Don't I just remember that? All in all, I think the only thing which sticks in your memory is the penalty kick shootout. I think uh, the last game of the season here, we played Swindon at home. We needed to win to be in the playoffs. Swindon were already in the playoffs. We were managed by Louis McCarry at the time. And uh, Gordon Owen got a penalty kick with five minutes to go to take us into the playoffs. And I can't remember if the keeper saved it or Gordon missed it himself. But uh, that stopped us going into the playoffs that year. And uh, we went to Wembley. Uh, a couple of weeks later in the Freight Rover final, the game went to penalty kicks. I think it was, we were winning 3-2, 4-3 at the time. Gordon Owen has to take the penalty to, to score to win the game for us at Wembley. And uh, missed it. Their player went up and scored. And it made it three each or four each at the time. And uh, it went to sudden death. And ironically, ironically, uh, all week, because the Freight Rover was always a couple of weeks after the season, uh, we had been training on the pitch, the season was over, and after training every day I was taking penalty kicks and I didn't miss one. I took them and I was rifling them into the net, and uh, it was between myself and Paul Fitzpatrick to, to take the first sudden death one, and I'd said, look, I want to take it, because I felt confident the way I had, uh, I had been taking them in training all week. And uh, when I walked out there, uh, hit it straight down the middle, and uh, Kevin Hitchcock dived out the way and saved at his feet, and uh, that's haunted me. 
And even nowadays, I still remember it and always tell people, uh, I don't take penalties anymore because I missed one, I think, in front of 70,000 at Wembley, so I'm certainly not going to miss one anywhere else. Tony Kenworthy is the hero. Despite that disappointment, City were getting a taste for cup runs, and in 1988-9, they reached the semi-final of the Littlewoods Cup, where they were drawn against Nottingham Forest. Remember that one? During the first leg in Nottingham, City were forced to weather early pressure, particularly from Forest skipper Stuart Pearce. Pearce now. Clough, lovely return, Pearce, and the goalkeeper was perfectly placed. Then, they struck a blow themselves. Marden, Gallias, McLaren, Walsh free on the left. Walsh. He's beaten Laws. Jordan was there poised. And the ball breaks and it's a fine shot and it's in! Unbelievable! The youngster, Marden, has given Bristol City the lead! Who would have believed it? Now. Laws Webb turned it on. Chapman was in there. It is an own goal. What a tragedy. John Pender's unfortunate own goal would prove costly. A city lost the home leg by a single goal. 1989-90 was another memorable season. Promotion to the second division albeit behind rivals Bristol Rovers, and further cup success, this time against Chelsea. Booked in by Gavin to Turner. All the way by Clark. Shelton, Llewellyn, Bristol City keeping possession. Hit from a long way and it's worth doing. Oh, they've missed it, they've all missed it, and it's in! Four minutes, Robbie Turner. Oh, well taken. Can he keep it in play? We haven't seen too much of Bob Taylor. Bristol City's uh, leading marksman with 17 goals, and incidentally, the only man left in the competition who scored in every round. Smith, Johnson. There might be something on here for City. Taylor, Shelton. Oh, they're queuing up. Turner, is it number two? Yes, the referee looks at the linesman. Chelsea, look at everybody. Newman. Bumstead picks up that. McAllister. Oh, yes, Wilson. Kevin Wilson pulls a goal back for Chelsea with seven minutes left. Turner. Turner, is this his hat trick? He struck it well. This will be it. Gavin. It's the last minute of the match. And Mark Gavin has made it 3 1 to third division Bristol City. And Chelsea are extinguished. But City's greatest cup victory of recent years came in 1994 against Liverpool. The third round FA Cup tie required two replays, the first being after a floodlight failure at Ashton Gate with the team's level at one all. Liverpool were obviously very optimistic when they took the tie back to Anfield, but City, now managed by Russell Osman, had other ideas. Bruce Grobelar in the Liverpool goal again worried his fans, here giving the ball away only for Liam Robinson with no goalkeeper in his sights to shoot over. Grobelar out of his area again in the second half. This time faced by Junior Bent, he handles the ball and was booked for his efforts. Also, as in previous ties, Bristol City's Junior Bent continued his habit of missing clear-cut chances. Halfway through the second half, just as City were worrying their dominance hadn't produced goals, Brian Tinian struck. Both the players and their fans were ecstatic.
Although Bristol City could have scored on at least two more occasions, Liverpool also threatened to equalise. But Bristol City held on, and the final whistle was greeted with triumphant scenes. And so the centenary season is with us. Now, I know we're still in the second division, which when you come to think about it is the old third division and we want to get out of it as quickly as possible. Well, the future of any football club is totally unpredictable, isn't it? And there's a great mood of optimism in the club. We've got mighty Joe Jordan back with us again as manager and we've got a new young chairman, Scott Davidson. Beam us up, Scotty. Obviously, it's a great honour and privilege at any time to be uh, chairman of the football club, but at this time, with our centenary year approaching, uh, it's obviously extra special. Bristol City is a big club, it's got um, a lot of potential, but um, the size of the club is dictated to by what it's achieved in the past. Those players uh, achieve success, and we really now must strive to emulate that success again. That's Cheesley. Popped across Ritchie! Absolutely wide open. Neville on his right foot, has a shot, well saved, Pinto scores! Now run Clayton to John Atio, who shoots, and he's made it! A goal with almost his first kick in an English shirt. Richie recovering and finding Whitehead. Another nice little cross by him! Oh, no doubt about that one from Cheesley! Jordan is there poised. The ball breaks, and it's a fine shot, and it's in! The youngster, Marden, has given Bristol City the lead. Oh, but it's still Richie. Royal! Oh, look at that. Two in two minutes for Joe Royal. 